Hi, everyone. I'm Dylan McGee, founder and executive producer of Makers, and welcome to Makers at Home Live. Today, we have Reshma Saujani with us. Um, I couldn't be more excited. She is the CEO and founder of Girls Who Code. She is the um, first uh, Indian American to run for Congress. She's written three books, and right here, this one, Brave, Not Perfect, I know it's backwards, um, is the one we're going to be talking about today. So much to learn in this. I'm hoping she's going to teach me. I still don't know how to be brave. Not, I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect. You know what I mean. Um, and she's the mom of two little ones, so we get to learn about what that's been like. Um, and she was one of our early Makers profiles. Um, right when we started, Makers was around the same time that she was starting Girls Who Code, and so we got to tell her story. So after this, you get to run and watch the Makers video. But let's bring her on to chat and learn about all that she's up to. Hold on. Hi! Hi. My we did it! Oh my God, look at you, glam. Oh, lady. you're... <laughs> I accidentally went blonde in the global health crisis. Accidentally. I love that. Yeah, We're basically. We're all talking about roots, and you're like, I went blonde. <laughs> How are you? Oh, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you, too. I'm going to just turn You've been a busy bee, Rashma. I know. I have been a busy bee. I've been in my basement interviewing, like, really amazing people. I mean, it's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Have you, um, I mean, in many ways, has it been, you know, access and I don't know if you felt this, but sometimes you're like, okay, maybe in this virtual environment, sort of so hard to get these big luminaries to have to fly and go to events and things like this. But, you know, in this way, it's win-win, right? Because yeah, totally. Is, right? Yeah. I think everybody who like loves Girls Who Code, who wanted to do something, but couldn't make that date and couldn't come to that thing. This was perfect. I also just feel like, there's a lot of empathy for kids right now. Like their entire situation is like a mess. And, you know, we taught 5,000 girls this summer from oh across gosh. the country to code. And so I think people were really joyful to like be able to help and give some inspiration. So what would that number have been? So you did it would have been 1200. We like tripled, almost tripled basically what we normally do. Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. I, I, uh, I was supposed to be on maternity leave and then COVID happened. My baby was like, you know, six weeks old and I had to come back to work. And I think, but I think a little bit of having that perspective of being on maternity leave and I had disconnected a little bit. I was, we, we were ready to pivot. And I, I always say I have the best team at Girls Who Code uh, possible. And I don't we, know. The Makers team is pretty cool. Too. I know. Your team is pretty cool. Okay. It's pretty amazing too. Okay. Right, so so right. both of us have the most amazing teams in the world. And, you know, we in some ways excelled in leading in a crisis and, and I think came together very quickly, got consensus and just pivoted uh, and made some tough decisions very early on. And I think that that served us. But what, give me some, like, part of this has to have been messy, right? Like, I'm, I mean, messy. So messy. I, if I turned my phone around and you could see my house, I mean, talk about not perfect. It's, like, everything going on here. Like, how is it having a six, now, so six-month-old or? Yes. And a uh, five-year-old, you have a five-year-old yeah. boy, right? Yes, who's like, I'm waiting for him to plant his face I in this, you know what I mean, in, like, a second. Bring him um, it is hard and horrible and amazing all at the same time. I, I, um, yeah, I think to be a CEO of a, of a nonprofit in the middle of a global crisis when like 80% of nonprofits are going to be shut down, you know, to be a mother of two young kids, to be homeschooling, to be spending more time with my partner than we've ever spent. Like we're much better when we're not spending this much time together. Right that I end up every day kind of collapsing on my bed and just being like, Ugh, you know, can I have a break? And, and so a I think, wine, maybe? and a glass of wine and like, well, I, I like lock myself in my room with like a chocolate chip cookie and a scoop of ice cream and just like <laughs> press the lock on the door. But you know, it's not been easy. And I think um, it's been exhausting, but I've had to like, really adopt some practices that have really served me and have helped me. And I was almost saying like this week, I actually feel a little normal. 
like, for some give reason. Give me a sense of what those are because I'm still feeling like I'm all over the place. And even in the day, I'm like, where do I, where should I put my computer today? Yeah. So I think morning practices and adding a night practice was helpful for me. So every morning, no matter what, I wake up, I like hang out with my dog, I cuddle with her, and I work out. And I, like setting out a workout, whether it's a run, whether it's a, you know, fitting room class, whether it's a Pilates class, like whatever it is, like I do it. And then I feel like no matter what happens, Jack Dorsey actually taught me this, no matter what happens, I've won the day. Like I've, no matter what happens in the day, I've won because I did something for me, regardless of my whole day goes to shit. And so that's, that's really, that's really helped me. You know, I think What's the second the night thing, routine? the night routine is, I'm just honest, I, I basically turn on the oven to 375, I take one scoop of chocolate chip cookie dough, I put it in the oven, I take it out, and everyone knows, like, not to mess with me when they see mommy, like, putting that cookie dough in the oven, I wait, I put a scoop of ice cream, and I go lock myself in a room, and nobody is supposed to bother me, and so I end the morning, I have the morning, and then I end the night, like, in, in, in two ways that I, like, that make me happy and make me joyful, and it's really helped me. But how are you, um, because I have teenagers, so I can say, oh, I'm doing a live, stay upstairs. You know, I've actually loved on, you know, team Zoom calls, having the kids around and, or even interviewing people like, you know, Serena Williams and she just turns the camera over there and there's little Olympia. It's so fun. Have you incorporated your kids into your work life or is that? Too yeah, I mean, but not, I don't, it's so funny. It's like, a, it's not fun when you're in it, right? Cause yeah. you're like, ah, right. So they, I haven't incorporated them, they've incorporated themselves. Or like the dog will just walk in right now. Like I was just interviewing Astro Christina. And of course I had like th two flies in my room. So I'm like sitting here like slam and, sh and she's like, you know, t I'm talking to her while I'm doing this. I mean, it's messy. And I think that that's the thing that's so important is like. Well, that brings up this. Yes. Because it is messy, right? See. And, there, and, it, and there's something about all of this that we've been doing that sort of makes it not, it's really hard to be perfect. Yeah. You can't be perfect in a pandemic. You just can't. And I, and I think that perfectionism should die in this pandemic. And the problem is, though, we still are finding it hard to do that. Like, you know, we're not bringing our children our Zoom calls. We're not showing up, you know, not like with our sweatpants and like, or it be being loud or crazy or you're on and off video. I mean, I was just with my, you know, this amazing woman, Raven, who does all of our Girls Who Code speaker series, and she's normally breastfeeding, you know, while she's doing it. And I was like, good for you. Like, that's the culture that we want to support and right. further. But we have to reward women for living messy lives. What can happen is you're – because did you see that article where 50% um, of women think they're going to get laid off? Uh, in this yes. next round, right, whereas 35% right. of men are. So you almost have to intentionally reward the messiness or, and not what we don't want to happen is men be like, Ooh, I don't know. She's got too much going on. Let's give that assignment to bill because that's what was happening in the real world. When we showed our kids or we asked for time or we, you know, wanted to basically demonstrate how full our life is, we were penalized for it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's interesting because, I mean, part of that is how do you reward that? How do we keep, you know, I guess it's just you have to be conscious. And when someone brings a baby, you say, oh, that's so great versus, oh, that's so awkward, I guess. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I think we have to like, we've been, I mean, almost 90% of my leadership team is female and they have mm -hmm. kids under the age of eight. This fall is going to be messy. Schools are not going to open. They're going to open up late. They're going to be remote. We're going to be having, you know, when you especially have kids under the age of 12, you're going to be basically having to maneuver their Zoom. And so I think getting ahead of it and talking about it and asking people what they need and figuring out how you structure projects and, you know, uh, setting up a schedule, I think is really important. Well, you, um, I, what I sort of love is, you know, you, you're sort of practicing what you preach. I read, I can't remember, somewhere about how you found out that your your son's kindergarten was going parse, and you were like, wait, no, this is killing me. I went in tailspin. I'm still in a tailspin. I mean, it's just <laughs> not what I imagined. It's kindergarten. I had, I had dreamt of the backpack I was going to buy him, and mm -hmm. I've been walking past his school for years. I was so excited, and like... 
And now it's just, I'm terrified. Even though I work in technology, I don't want him staring at a computer screen. And, you know, I, my niece, you know, was supposed to move and go to Pratt. And NYU just found out the dorms are closed. She's doing remote in Georgia now. I was so excited because she was like the girl, I know, you know, the daughter I never had. I mean, it seems like just every, every day that goes by, another thing's ruined. You know, but I think the thing is we can't can't see 2020 as being canceled. Right. You know, we can't see it that way. We have to look at it from a different perspective. And I'm I'm I try I try to do that every single day. Well, and you I mean, we'll move on from perfectionism, but I am so with you because when you're used to the world working in a certain way, now that works in a different way. Plus, you have this tendency to want to be perfect. It's like, you know, there, it's lose-lose. There's no way. Yeah. You gotta throw in the towel, right? And it's like, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this. It's also just, you know, we're all, there's so much judgment online in an opposite way. So most people aren't living their real lives on Instagram anymore, right? right? They're having these like secret joyful things that they're doing, but they're not showing people because they don't know how it's going to react. So it's like we're living in this very strange world right now where we're not exactly sure how we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to feel, how we're supposed to behave. I think people feel a lot of guilt being happy right now yeah. and doing something for themselves because there's so much suffering. So how do we then, how do we turn it from not being perfect again to being brave? Like how can we be brave right now, Rashma? Yeah, I think the first thing is appreciating. What do you mean? Well, brave my definition of brave is everyday bravery, right? So it's not even like the bravery to run for office or the bravery to save a baby from a burning, burning building. It's the bravery to leave your video on on the Zoom call. It's the bravery to raise your hand immediately when you don't know exactly what you're going to say. It's the bravery to tell you exactly what I think with, and not worry about what you're going to think about me. So it's to me, it's that everyday bravery because I think so many of us have daily things that happen to us where we don't use our voice or we shrink ourselves. And then we go home and we beat ourselves up. Why didn't I speak up? Right. Why didn't I say that? Why didn't I do? And it's those daily indignities that really affect us more than those big moments. So to me, I wanna teach women how to be everyday brave. And I believe that part of the connection between learning how to be everyday brave is like braving yourself up. So I do this with physical challenges. So for so long, I was afraid to go downhill on my bike. So I would go down, I would get to the point where I was inclined by my house, I would get off my bike and I would walk the bike down. Right. Or I wouldn't like, you know, jump into the water or I would be afraid to do something like surfing or, you know, singing karaoke. And I've noticed that when I let myself because, you know, you know, when you're trying to do something that you're afraid to do, um, like when I ran for when I first ran for office, I get that pit in my stomach and almost want to throw up. And because I had learned to give up before I even tried, I would talk myself out of any professional challenge. Mm. Now, that feeling kind of returns when you're about to do something physically scary. And so if I make myself do it, right, and I feel euphoria afterwards, I take that feeling and I put that into the professional thing that I'm scared to do. And you realize that when you, you can actually see the other side of it and you can actually feel euphoric. And fear is actually a good thing because it makes you feel so damn alive. But that euphoria, one of the things I love about your book is sometimes it's, it's not just, it's not always positive, right? I mean, sometimes something happens like when you said you lost and then you went into, you had a pity party, right? Yeah. So like sometimes allowing yourself to have that pity party can also be part of that bravery yeah i think it's recognizing that bravery doesn't always feel good listen yeah. i have been especially you know after george floyd's murder i'm on a lot of pretty interesting boards and i have certainly been that woman of color who's like enough and you know and i know that i have a bunch of very powerful white men staring at me being like who let her on the board right and i will normally hang up that zoom call and be like oh shit you know but proud of myself that i that i set, spoke truth for right. myself and others but it doesn't feel good always right. and i think that's what you i tell people like it's not like you're like woohoo i was brave it's like oh shit like did i just ruin the rest of my life <laughs> well and it leads to that other message of yours which is um what what's the the title it's like nick's the need to please or something like that yeah 
which yeah. is, I mean, inherent in so many of us. Like, I think we want to be perfectionists because we want to please everybody, right? Yeah, we're so worried. I mean, I've been thinking about this. I'm writing a, my, I'll give you my preview for my Failure Friday post tomorrow, but okay. like I used to love Inbox Zero. It's so funny when you sent me, when I sent you an email and you're like, oh my God, how did I miss it? Because I similarly miss a lot of emails now because I can't do Inbox Zero. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I used to, and I had to ask myself, like, why would I, why did I used to answer every single email? Cause I didn't want people to be mad at me. Right. Right. Now you're like, now you can just tell the world like, right now. If Rach wants to respond to you, she's busy. She's not perfect. <laughs> or I'm watching Netflix. You know what I mean? And I'm tired. Right. Like it's just, it, yeah. So things have had to go. Yeah. Right. Things have had to go, and you've had to like be really real about what what you can do and what you can't do in this moment. But I have a hard time believing that things are going to have to go. I want to move on to. I mean, first of all, I just want everyone to know: buy this book. The podcast is. I think you're in season five now. It's something like that. Yeah. Something awesome. <laughs> it's just a little daily dose of goodness, um, and so I really truly um, want everyone to do that. And, and, and you said you have these failure Fridays. I mean, what a refreshing way to go into the weekend. So that's always like a good weekend dose for everybody. So make sure you're getting those Fridays. But then, you know, I kind of still don't believe it. I think you're perfect because, you know, you are in the middle of a pandemic and not only one pandemic, a pandemic within a pandemic and these little kids Girls Who Code is just exploding. As you said at the beginning, you've gone from being able to train 1,500 to 5,000. I mean, how yeah, amazing. But, yes, but it's come at a huge personal cost, not just for me, but for all of the leaders in my organization. I have never worked so hard. I have never been so exhausted. I have never cried so much mm. in staff meetings all the time. You know, because it's, I mean, you know this, you're, it's like when these things happen, the first organization's funding to be cut are ours. Yeah. Those that are working on women, those that are trying to like elevate girls education. And so you have to literally, you have to fight. You know, I had to let people go. I did not want to do that. Right. That was just gut wrenching. Yes. And we had to very quickly pivot. And when you're kind of making decisions, especially decisions that are hard to make, I didn't know if I didn't know if the right thing to do was to move everything virtually. You know, I didn't know if the right thing to do was to, you know what I mean, like make some hard decisions that we had to make. And so, yes, I think when you look at it now, I think the organization is breathing a sigh of okay, we're getting on the other yeah, end of it. But, but March and April were okay. literally hell. Okay, there were tears, there was struggle. There were there tears. Was, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Because we, you know, we, we were like what are we gonna do? Like, let's do Instagram Live. Okay. There were a lot of tears okay. and a lot of there are a lot of tears and a lot of struggle. Okay, you're normal. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, there are a lot of people saying, "What's the name of the book?" Because I know I keep holding oh, it yeah. because I love it, and it's backwards, but it says "Brave, Not Perfect." And again, there's a podcast too. Um, so, you and I started Girls Who Code and Makers right around the same time. I mean, I think we started in 2012. Didn't you start around? Yeah, and you were, Makers was one of the first people to ever profile me, period. And I, I will never forget being in that room when I got that award. I was like, what am I doing here? Like, <laughs> I was such at the beginning of Girls Who Code in my career. I just lost my race. I had, and you gave me the courage to believe in myself. So I forever will never forget, like, that interview and how I was feeling in that moment and just introducing me to the world and my story. And I'm forever grateful to that. Well, I just got goosebumps, but it was, um, it's so amazing when you do something and when you see a story like yours and you can bring it into the world, but then look what else you've done in the past eight years. I mean, so tell me if you talk about girls who code, we're doing right now a documentary called not done. It's coming out in the fall and it is, basically the story of, you know, what's happened since the last election and where we are in the women's movement. But the title says it all. We're not done. Love it. Really, when you look at the stats, as much as it can feel like there's a lot of progress, sometimes I get really bummed out. So I'm wondering specifically for girls and STEM and technology engineering, all the, you know, STEM, are you, have you seen progress in eight years? Like, are things changing? <laughs> 
I mean, yes, I think we saw pro we saw progress. I mean, we taught 300,000 girls. We had 80,000 college age alumni. I mean, if you went to computer science departments when we started, they were at 12, 13 percent. Uh, last year, they're almost at 25, 26, 27 percent. So we had dramatically moved the needle. But the next phase of our fight was really inside technology companies and getting them to hire women and people of color and getting them to change their cultures, which many of them thought they didn't need to change. And that was the battle we were starting to begin to fight right. when COVID happened. The second part of this, and I'm sure you see this all the time, is I meet young women, because, and look, they're not crazy. It's like because of racism and sexism, we have this very loud voice in our head that tells us that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough. And we've really never challenged white male privilege. We've assumed that there is a meritocracy, that everybody who's in that room is exceptional. And we know that that is not true, but we've never actually, and I think that's one of the hopeful conversations I hope we're happening yeah. after George Floyd's murder, is to really question the fundamental structure that assumes that there isn't white privilege when there is, right? right? And, and I think so many women and people of color question their merit and question whether they're are like their right to be in the room because they assume that they somehow snuck in the door and 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 other people make us feel that way and i think that that is the battle you know what i mean that we have to continue to really right, because to really now fight got, now the pipeline conversation is harder to have right you could because right pipeline's can, good you can turn to any ceo any head of hr and say Mm, I've got plenty of people for you, but it's now that changing that mentality that hopefully I'm always a hopeful person. And hopefully now there's, there isn't, is an opening, but yeah. still the stats haven't changed a lot. 100%. 50% of uh, computer science graduates at MIT are women. I literally carry around these stats with me. I'm like, so why are your numbers still at 18 and 19% when MIT, Stanford, Harvard, all the places you hire from have far more women graduating. And I literally have lines and lines of names of women who are like 4.0, black, Latina, graduating MIT, can't get a job at Google, Facebook, right? Like, and so it's, it's not, it doesn't make sense. And it's not true. And I think that challenging that is the yes. next, That's the, the next, next struggle. Wave. Yes, yes. So maybe when you and I have this chat in another eight years, we'll say, remember we talked about that? Yeah. And now look at the numbers. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's, that's also why we want to, that's why I love makers because you profile women's stories and creators and innovators. And I think the other thing is, and this is the thing I've really been struggling with is I just don't know if you can shake change cultures that have been built that exclude us and whether, the better work is to basically encourage women to create their own stories. Mm -hmm. And I think what you do is so important because it makes you realize that there are other women in that field that actually did it. So you know what? I can do it too. You know, you cannot be what you cannot see. And I think right. that we have to keep reminding young girls and young women and sharing the stories and having institutions like makers basically profiling and sharing these stories because we may not be able to change the Googles and the Facebooks and those companies and their culture, they may never let us in. They may never let us run it. So we have to build our own. Right. Because you know what? We're unstoppable, right? So if they we are unstoppable. Us, we'll do our own thing. Right. We'll create our own Google. Yep. Um, yes. Sir. Okay. I'm very conscious of, of, of time and your time. And so I just want to, um, as we wrap this up, I do want, because you're, you know, politics in your blood. And I feel like every time I, if I, anytime I show up at any political, you know, pre-COVID rally, like Reshma's there in the front cheering on whoever it may be. You're such a supporter. So just give me your, who do you think is going to be the VP candidate? for? Oh my God, come on. I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know. I don't, I really don't know. I think it's, well, I think it's either Kamala Rice, Susan, I mean, Kamala Harris, Susan Rice, or Tammy Duckworth. Yeah, me too. One of the three of them. Me too. Me too. Um, okay. But I'm so excited. It's a woman, and I either one. I mean, like we're, I'm, I'm in for Biden. I'm excited about him. I mean, he, you know, I'll never. I always share the story when I after I lost my race against Maloney, I was at you know a Christmas party that at the VP's house, 
he spent 45 minutes with me telling me not to give up in a corner. And like when nobody in the party would talk to me. So like he's always been a champion of like of women and of people running for office and of elevating these voices. And he's going to be a great president. So I'm excited. I'm really excited about him. Yeah. Well, we're all, you know, we're in register to vote mode and, and let's get everyone excited for that. Do it. Um, all right. Well, any parting words of wisdom before I leave you, Rashma? Besides, I love you and thank you. I mean, I always say, no, I'm, I'm serious, Dylan, because I always say that and I tell my I tell my young students that is that it's so important for people to believe in you and to see you and you saw me and I'm forever grateful for that. Well, you've been very loyal to us and I'm very grateful to that. And now we have to pass the baton and as you see people, you want us to tell the stories of- Oh, I will. Uh, share them. Let's get I them will. out there. And the good news is right now, I'm going to follow in Reshma's footsteps and I'm going to get my hair highlighted after, <laughs> since January. And um, so these great, you, you went blonde, I went gray. But the next time you see me, hopefully I'll look like Reshma. Woo! All right, Reshma, sending you so much Bye. fun. Enjoy your talking chip cookie tonight. Thanks Thank so you. Much. I will. Bye-bye.